Um, I don't really have a whole lot of a story to tell, but I'll just try to share with you some of the visions that we had when we started our company and why we do some of the things we do. I, I want to start off by saying um, I'm really proud of the restaurant industry in the last 10 years and particularly the last five and the efforts that so many of us have made to make uh, our place that we live in a better place. And uh, ultimately, there's too many of us that live in the world and the world's getting smaller all the time. So every little thing that we do really does make a difference. And partnering with Ted Turner made that easy for us to make part of our core values. Um, Ted's an environmentalist, owns two million acres of land, protects it uh, with, with a vengeance, uh, lets mother nature take over. And part of that is in great American bison story. So I'll start by just talking a little bit about, about bison. Um, Bison were pretty much an endangered species. You all know there was at one time 50 million that roamed. As a matter of fact, they talk about when you read stories about uh, seeing bison uh, along a train ride for 20 or 30 miles so thick that, that, that they're just, you know, were literally in the way. And we were down to less than 1,000 animals alive in North America. And so when Ted got involved, there was about 70,000 bison alive in the world. Today I can report to you that there's over 600,000 bison alive in the world, 600,000 uh, approximately in North America, that's Canada and the US, and we have literally saved the great American bison. Why is that important? Well, it's important because sustainability, creating environments around us where natural things can thrive and prosper is part of the basic fundamentals of our world and, and the earth that we live on. Bison are native to North America, they're the only unique uh, protein that's available uh, in, that was born, raised, and meant to be here on the Great Plains. And seeing them back in their natural habitat is a real uh, exciting and fun experience. So here we are. We created uh, you know, a, a commodity out of what was once an endangered species. Why is that important? It's important because by being a commodity, we have it available to us for a long time to come, many, many years to come in a healthy, productive state. Uh, just a couple of statistics, there's about 500,000 in the commercial herd. That's 53,000 bison are taken to market a year in the entire world. Just here in the United States, there's approximately 135,000 cattle taken to market every day. So you can see it's still a very niche player. But here's what's happened. Um, when Ted got into this business, I can promise you that having been the founder of CNN and the billion dollar gift to the UN and whether you agree or disagree with, with anything that Ted says or does it politically, Ted actually is, is a steward of the world in a healthier place and he does care so much about the environment, he does care about nuclear threats and he does care about making the world a better place through the UN Foundation. No one can take that away from him. But what he also cared about was bringing the great American bison back to its glory days. So when I went to him with this restaurant concept, I've been trying to help him get started. And I thought that the Longhorn concept in Capitol Grill would have been great to have bison in. And the smarter people in the company than me disagreed with me. So I lost, they won. And um, then you know I sat down with Ted. And Ted said, well, there's four things, four reasons why I'll do this. The first reason was to help the great American bison come back. We've done that. Second was to help the ranchers. There's about 4,400 ranchers of bison in the world or in the country right now. They were struggling. They were, they, they were unable to make ends meet, and, and those ranchers were in danger of going out of business. The, the third reason was that Ted has 2 million acres, approximately 14 uh, uh, ranches that raise bison as their only cash crop. So he wants to protect that land after he's no, no longer here and so his family can have it and it's put in a nature conservancy and that land will always be uh, left to the world as it's supposed to be. So that was his third reason. And the fourth reason was a sustainable restaurant company. I can promise you that the first three didn't mean as much to me as the sustainable restaurant company did. But anyway, so we partnered up and, and, and what we've been able to do, we're proud of. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're happy that we've been able to, to be uh, limitedly successful in the restaurant business. What we're happiest about is that we've been able to really introduce bison to America's table. Right now, demand is four times supply. 
And the reason I'm going to bring this up is because everything I'm going to talk to you about, especially when it comes to sustainability, I firmly believe is rooted in basic economics. If we demand it, someone will supply it. And if they supply it, we're going to get a better price for it. We're going to get it more usable. We're going to get it more user friendly. And we're going to see new innovation. And that's really what happened with the bison because the creativity of bringing bison to America's table through the restaurant chain and through other marketing ideas that really weren't nearly as successful, we've been able now to create four times the demand as there is supply. As a matter of fact, Whole Foods would take 100% of the bison supply if, if they could. So one of the things I get, I put a $5 coupon if there's a Ted's Montana Grill next year, go eat a bison filet. 97% fat free, top five foods women should eat for iron replacement. Available 365 days a year at Ted's Montana Grill. It's the only place you can get it. It's the only place you can get it year round. So we've really introduced bison to the table and that's one of our most proud moments for our sustainability efforts. But what else have we done? Well, you know, it was easy. I was having a conversation at breakfast this morning. It was a little bit easier for me to go out and set in motion a corporate culture and a, a core value that said we're going to do everything possible to be as sustainable and as small a footprint as we could possibly be, and we're going to be on the leading edge of new ideas uh, 10 years ago when we started. That was because I had a partner that cares about it. So I didn't have to go fight with him about the economics of the deal. And we were talking about some of the easy things, you know, um, electricity. Uh, we changed uh, to LED lights. Uh, 56 restaurants, $111,000 investment, two-year guarantee on the bulbs, 100% in, in every restaurant. Saved us a quarter of a million dollars the first year, saved us a quarter of a million dollars the second year. Some of those light bulbs lasted longer than the two years. That's a no-brainer, y'all. And that's pretty easy to push up the ladder through the CFO and the bean counters and all the rest of the folks and, and, and get it done. But some of these other ideas take a little bit more time. So when I started TEDS, I sat down and I said, I don't want anything that's not recyclable. I don't want any styrofoam, plastic, or, or non-reusable materials anywhere in the restaurant. I didn't know much about LED buildings and other things like that, so we did some of that, but we didn't do all of it. That was not the goal. The goal was to take an industry that uses five times as much water, creates five times as much trash, Create, uses five times as much energy as any other retail business and make us less harmful, less of a footprint in the environment in any way that we could. So, you know, it was pretty easy to think that we'd get everything in glass bottles at the time, and now we've gone to aluminum Coca-Cola instead of glass. I was known for a while by Neville Isdale as a pain in the glass over there at Coca-Cola because I'd go over and I'd go into... Uh, Robert Woodruff's office, and they have all these pictures, and if you notice, their, their television commercial are with 12-ounce glass bottles. Well, I can tell you there's no 12-ounce glass bottles except for one line in Mexico anywhere in the world, but Coca-Cola is in their advertising. So I kept saying, you know, I want it in a glass, I want it in glass, and, and, and pretty soon they, they, they capitulated, and we actually got a contract from them where we could buy Coca-Cola in glass bottles directly, which has never been done before, and distribute it to ourselves. But you know, right now they're doing everything in aluminum, and frankly, aluminum, not as romantic, not as old world, not as cool, but a whole lot better for recycling. So those are the kind of things. Probably the most fun story, and I put it on your seat as a paper straw. The only mistake I made here is I should have been an investor in this company uh, because in, 19, in 2001, when I was... Um, getting ready to, to open TEDs. I got through the whole list of things and I could use a wooden stir stick instead of a plastic stir stick and I could you know, use glass and I could use aluminum and we could recycle cardboard and we could send our, our, our French fry oil out for biodiesel. At the time we didn't get paid much, now we get paid pretty much about 99 cents a pound for it. You know, we could do all those things. But when it came to the straw, think about it. You know, how addicted are we as a culture to straws? Um, I'll tell you about a kid, he's, he's 11 years old now, his name's Milo. You can look him up on his website, he's from Boulder, Colorado. He's challenging our whole industry to just volunteer, ask people if they want a straw first. I don't know if you know this, but every day in the world, 365 days a year, there's 500 million straws used in the world and disposed of. 
500 million. It's cruise ships, when they signed that contract about seven years ago about t waste refuge into our oceans, you know, you, you all know about the plastic islands. We've got the size of Texas floating around out there in about six places. Um, you know, the number one thing that they, that they took out of their refuse was plastic straws and they replaced them with these paper straws. Well, here's the CNN version of the story. So I get on Google, which isn't a Google a wonderful thing now? I was, I'm old enough, right? It was the encyclopedia and the card catalog, right? Now you just Google it. So anyway, we Googled the, plastic, the paper straw and it said, well, it hadn't been made anywhere in the world since 1970. So 31 years later, we find the name of this company The grandfather invented the paper straw in 1833. Let's give him a call. We gave him a call. Got him on the phone for about 45 minutes, challenged him, said, wow, you know, I want a paper straw. I was a kid. I remember him. And he goes, well, let me get back to you. Got him excited. So he called back. He said, well, you know, our engineers, we found that machine out in the warehouse. You know, I think we can get it to work. And uh, let me see. He goes, now, these are going to be expensive. I said, I know. I just want to try. He goes, all right. A couple weeks later, he called back. He said, well, we got the machine working. How many straws do you want? I said, I'll take 10,000. He said, well, I don't have anywhere to put them. I said, okay, well, just send them to me any way you can. About two or three weeks later, here comes like these trash bags full of paper straws into my office. I said, oh, okay, well, I thought they might be packaged a little better than that. <laughs> but anyway, we put them in the restaurant, and they were just as terrible as they were in the 50s. You know, they had beeswax on them 100%. They collapsed. Nobody liked them. They were terrible. So we had to capitulate. We had to move off of our core values and off of our concept development, and we put the plastic straw in, much to my chagrin. We had the paper straws available, but that's what we did. Well, anyway, about two years into the program, I thought, you know, this just isn't right. We're making a statement. We're trying to be leaders in this industry. I'm not comfortable with the fact that we have plastic straws in the restaurant. So I gave the guy a call, his name's Mark. I gave Mark a call and I said, hey Mark, how are we doing in the paper straw business? He said, well, not that well. So you all don't really order too many. I said, yeah, I kind of figured that. We've gone to plastic straws, but how are you doing? And he said, well, we're doing great. It's unbelievable. We made this deal with the cruise ship lines. This business has taken off. We're uh, you know, selling them in Europe. We're now wrapping them in, in paper. We're putting, we formed a company called Aardvark Straw Company. As a matter of fact, in two months, we're going to open a factory dedicated only to making paper straws in Indiana. You should come. I said, no, what I should have done was gotten 10% of that business before I called you. But anyway, the point is that that small conversation created a whole industry. And if you look up Aardvark Straw, you'll see now they're doing all sorts of cool things. And Milo's going to go out and, and try, to, try to push for a paper straw on the, on the side of a juice box. Think about it, how many juice boxes the kids eat. And they got the little plastic straw. So the reason I tell you all this is because small ideas that can turn into big changes, every individual doing something to contribute to the health and well-being and taking a risk, some of these ideas are going to work and some of them aren't. Sometimes we're going to be successful and sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're going to make a big impact, sometimes we're not. But as it comes out of the paper straws, it really did make a big impact. It really did make a big change. And so I would hope that every one of us that's in the restaurant industry would first go to a voluntary straw program. And here was Milo's answer to Ellen DeGeneres. She said, well, I don't know. We like a straw. Women really like a straw because they're not sure the glass is clean. He said, well, it doesn't seem to bother you when you're having an alcoholic beverage or a glass of wine, right? So the point is that out of small mouths come some really important little ideas because the truth of the matter is we don't use a straw much when we drink alcohol, but we sure do when we drink Coca-Cola or water. So I think we can learn to do without, and that would be best. But just a couple other things, you know, the paper straw, the highlights, you know, the things that we do to go cups, right? I mean, we used paper 10 years ago. Now we have all this, uh, you know, technology for different types of materials, whether they be potatoes and cornstarch for materials or whether we use cornstarch cups. And you know what? Let's talk about that for a minute because the truth is that that uses up a lot of energy to create those. And, you know, there's a decision, but here's what's happening. Technology is improving dramatically. So each time that we 
continue to demand those things, then changes are starting to happen. Changes are beginning so that, we're, that they're less harmful. The process to build these ideas is less harmful to the environment, and it's also more affordable to us. The more we demand changes from our vendors and the more we ask for the right products, the more products are going to be developed, the more they're developed, the more the demand goes up, basic economics are going to take over. So, you know, uh, we were talking about takeaway containers this morning at breakfast. And, you know, the truth is now, I ju we just did a, a, a redo. Some of the, you know, totally recyclable and reusable and, and, and you know, the three R's in, in can take away. Uh, some of the quality is not that good, but there's actually stuff out there. And it's competitive in pricing now to straight up plastic. And that was three or four times before what it used to be. So, again, we're starting to make this work. Um, you know, I think that at the bottom line, just our little company, right? I mean, we're, we're small. We, we recycle 370 tons of plastic, glass, and pet cardboard a year. Um, 16,000 pounds recycled per year in every, in every restaurant, you know. We have two restaurants that do 100%, actually three now, that do 100% composting and recycling of all uh, waste materials. We have 60, 000, 60 tons of wet refuse just at three little restaurants last year. That all went into, instead of going into a landfill, went into a compost pile and was reused. Two things, I don't know if you know this, the borough of Manhattan, the borough of Manhattan, New York City, sends five million pounds of wet refuse garbage on a train to North Carolina to a landfill every week. Five million pounds. Just the borough of Manhattan. That's all reusable, recyclable materials. We need a way to find it. You know, we do these things. So I'll tell you a, a, a quick story. And, and, and my journey in this is, is so exciting for me because I learn lots of things and I listen and I ask and I talk and we go out and we try to find new ideas. And sometimes they're great, and sometimes they're not. But just one real quick one. There's a gentleman, Ron Vanderhoevel, who has got lots of secret patents pending and has is, is got a test facility in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Now imagine this, right now if you recycle, one of the big problems with what? I mean, it's a, it's a pain in the glass to recycle um, at, at your restaurants or, or at our restaurant because we have to retrain, we have to separate, we have to worry about cross-contamination, we have to get the aluminum where it's supposed to go, the glass where it's supposed to go, the cardboard, the paper, the this, the that. That's a problem everywhere. Okay, Starbucks, we all love Starbucks, right? Pretty much, unless you're a competitor, and we love your coffee too. And um, I'm not a Starbucks guy. But anyway, the bottom line is, right, they have a big deal about recycled paper cups for coffee. Gosh, how many of those do you think we go through as addicted as we all are to those $5 coffee drinks? It's 10% recycled material. That's all the better the technology has been up until recently. What if I were to tell you that this gentleman, and I've had chemical engineers and, and, and physical engineers and all sorts of people get involved with it, and Global Green is now running the final test. Over the last two years, they perfected a factory that would be in your community, not connected to the grid in any way, need no outside resource for power or energy, and would be able to take, right now there's a test coming out of New York City on trains, uh, millions of pounds of garbage, that comes off the streets of New York, scooped up by the street sweepers, put in a plastic bag, tied up, and, and being transported to Green Bay. Garbage coming right out of the back of fast food restaurants, not separated, everything and anything that goes in there, in the trash bag and being hauled off to Green Bay. That stuff will enter the front door, come out the back door with water, clean air, fuel pellets, tissue, and 40% recycled material coffee cups. It's revolutionary. It's a change agent for around the world. These facilities will not only be an economic boon for the communities where they're built, but it'll eliminate the need for landfills and other projects that cost us millions and billions of dollars to maintain and take care of. We literally can take 100% of what comes out the back door of a restaurant or off the streets and recycle 100% of it. 
That's an amazing thing for me. It's not 100% there yet, but it's making progress every year. And every time we have that conversation and every time we support it, we start to make a little bit of a difference. So as we go through this stuff, you know, you can say to yourself, well, okay, gee, what does this cost me? Well, two things I want to talk about before we get to that. It probably does cost you something. But I maintain that we can get it back from our guests by doing the right thing. You know, there's 7 billion people on the face of the earth today. Ted's 73 years old. When he was born, there was 2 billion. Facts are that there's too many of us not to care for our earth in a different way. We need to do things like composting. We need to do those kind of things, and they can be profitable too. But in the meantime, as we go through this cycle, I think we have to be willing to try these ideas, whether we see a solid economic return on that investment or not. So let's talk about solar for a minute. We own a restaurant down in Tallahassee, Florida. State had a big uh, tax break if you invested in solar panels. We put solar panels on the restaurant. We cut our electric bill by 5%. It wasn't a big investment. We got most of it back. We had a two and a half to three year payment. Granted, we got a, a big tax benefit out of it. That's the only way we got it that fast, but it works. So as you know, some of you may know this, Ted is really heavily invested in wind and solar. He has all this land. He wants to try to develop energy as best he can. And so he ends up uh, going out and, and building you know, a giant solar field in New Mexico, 300, 300 acres. Creates energy for, for, th for 3,000 homes. But what, what really happened is at our building in downtown Atlanta, we've got 25 solar panels. We run a nine-story building that's in the zero waste zone, has residential, commercial, and, uh, and office com components. We create more energy with those 25 solar panels than we can use. So I think that, that what we know from, from, from all these conversations I'm having with you is that we actually can try and do, do different things and create a different environment and, and, and try things that, that may not look to be wonderful on the surface, but a willingness to try, which is really what the TED story is. So just a couple of, of facts, and I think you probably already know this. The average American has four pounds of trash a day. 1,460 pounds a year, there's billions of us. Uh, two plastic bottles recycled make enough polyester for a baseball cap. This is my favorite one. It takes 75,000 trees to print the New York Times on Sunday. 75,000 trees to print the New York Times on Sunday. You know, aluminum cast la uh, cans last 80 to 100 years in a land full, plastic bags 1,000 years. Tell you a real quick story. I was up at King Estate, the largest contiguous organic winery in the country, in the world actually, and they you know, were doing all this composting and we were in the field looking at last year's pile and this year's pile and the front end loader comes to get a scoop to take out some compost to spread around the winery and sticking right in the middle of it. it's a giant plastic bag. Now put that in your mind because that compost had taken a year to make and was wonderful and was an incredible recycling story and there it is. There's the trash bag that we should all regret. So I think that, that, that one of the things that is important to us is to know that there are better ways to do things by trying new things. They aren't always going to be an economic return right now. I do believe that society and the guests that we're trying to serve, particularly in our business, is willing to give us an extra five cents in order to, to make that happen. I believe that, that our industry is uh, the cornerstone of the economy in the United States. We don't outsource any jobs. We're 600 you know, we're about a million restaurants, we're about 13 million employees, we create $600 billion in GDP. I mean, we really take care of what is the future jobs and, and, and the ways of the world. But we also need to contribute to the health and well-being of the world around us. And so as, as, as I finish up and, and open this up to questions, I just think that the, that the bottom line is that we believe uh, firmly, at least in our organization, that leaders lead by example, that we step up and put our money where our mouth is, that we try to do some things differently that help make a difference in the long run. And whether that's a bunch of little small things, you know, it's not, this is not, you know, when I tell you, oh, wow, we, you know, put all waterless urinals in, everybody goes, oh, boy, that's a fun subject, you know, but it saves a lot of water. 
You know, and, and if everybody, just think if every public facility had non-flush toilets, non-flush, you know, urinals. It's huge amounts of gallons of water. I mean, the fact is, I would tell you all, please read a book, whether you, it's not a political book, it's, it's Lester Brown. How many people have ever heard of Lester Brown? Lester Brown's an, uh, 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 an economist. It's called um, Full World Empty Plates. And it's about the current conditions that we find ourselves in with trying to have clean water, clean air, and enough food. And I can tell you that that is fundamental no matter where you line up on anything else. It's fundamental freedom that we deserve to have clean air, clean water, and plenty of food to eat. And so the little things that you may do tomorrow, the little things that you may do today, the little conversations you might have that would seem irrelevant are actually more relevant than you believe because those conversations start people's minds working and when the human mind puts itself to work on sustainability, environmental protection, and doing the right thing, we can make a difference and we can go forward and be a little bit less of an imprint in our personal lives, in our professional lives, and in our business lives. And with billions and billions of us, eventually it becomes a big deal. So thank you all very much. I appreciate you all uh, listening. And I'm open for, I think I have 15 minutes, I've been told, for, uh, for, uh, for some conversation. So I really enjoy getting some questions or some comments from the audience. <clears throat> so I, <clears throat> thank you so much, George. So I have a microphone here. Questions? I can um, probably hear you. Okay, I know, but just in case no one else can. So <laughs> I'm curious about your um, footprint of your restaurants. How did you guys decide where to grow and what is your plan? I'm in Colorado, so I, yeah, okay. I have you guys everywhere. I was just looking at uh, the Hopefully. fact that you've got a lot in Colorado and we love your your food, um, but you're not everywhere. So is there a plan to grow or are you going to stay yes. where you're at? Yes, and um, thank you for it. I'll, I'll be like one of the candidates. That was an excellent question. <laughs> okay, so um, Colorado was a no-brainer for me as we were trying to test this, right? So what you had at the time, let me take you back. What you had at the time was uh, several attempts at creating a market for bison, and they failed. And, and you know, generally agricultural folks, farmers, ranchers, you know, they fell in love with bison, and they went from $100 on the hoof to, for a bread heifer to $2,000, and they borrowed all this money at the bank, and they were convinced as soon as they brought that product to market two to three years down the road that it was going to fly off the shelves. And unfortunately, that's rarely how it happens. I mean, it's a tough market to break into and it was a costly item. So the end of the day was there was all of it going in the freezer and the industry was in real trouble. So we decided to, to create Ted's Montana Grill as an avenue to really as a marketing arm, right? To, to demonstrate how good bison was and how good it could be and, and how it was not ostrich emu or some other funky you know, protein out there. So I studied the country. Ted wanted to do things big. Those of you know his reputation. He likes to go fast, he likes to go big. I wish I knew a little bit more about that then than I do now, but I would have put the reins on a little bit. But the end of the day is Colorado was a no-brainer, and it's our second largest market with nine restaurants in the Denver ADI and one in Bozeman, Montana. And it's the number one consumption of bison in the country. Simply put, bison was more well-known, more of a household product, and Rocky Mountain Natural Meats is right there. And the fact is that Coloradans eat a little bit healthier, they liked their, their game, or their wild, and they were number one consumers. Went to Columbus, Ohio, because it's a great Midwest test market, and we did our own uh, market down in Atlanta because, obviously, it's our hometown. Um, our expansion plans were we ended up building 56 restaurants in, 60, in 72 months in 19 states, uh, all company-owned. As I said, if I knew then what I know now, I would have slowed Ted down a little bit. But um, we built those, and, and, and we slowed down in 2007, which was kind of the plan. We got a mass number out there. It helped get the bison on the plate. Helped Ted with his first three reasons for going into business, and left George kind of trying to figure out what to do next. So what we did was we, um, 
we, 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 we slowed down and we had to close some restaurants, primarily in the Midwest and beef country. And we really weren't up to it. Our expansion plans now, we're expanding in the Northeast, uh, uh, from in the Boston and, and nor, nor, Northeastern corridor. We're expanding in the, in the DC uh, market there, the, the kind of the heartland. A little bit in Atlanta. We're definitely gonna do uh, out west in, in terms of, we're gonna stay east of the Mississippi, or east of the Rocky Mountains and do, there's a couple more sites in Denver. Uh, there's a couple more sites in Denver. I like go to Boise, Idaho, Salt Lake City, some places like that. Our number one restaurant in the company last year was Bozeman, Montana. And um, it, we have a great site there with, a little, with an outdoor and some music venue, and it's in an old hotel in downtown Bozeman, but it literally is our busiest restaurant. So sometimes, you know, things fall in different places than you would think, and I don't think we're going to make it right away. I mean, here's a dilemma for me. We're an East Coast company. It's a long way out here. It's a business community that you have to really understand and really know how to do, do business here. And I think if we were to open up a satellite office and really make a commitment to 30 or more restaurants up and down the West Coast, that might make sense. But for right now, we're going to backfill Chicago, Denver, the Northeast, D.C., Florida, and Georgia, and kind of in, the, in, in those areas where we already have a footprint. And it just seems to make sense. We, don't, we aren't real efficient. We have, uh, you know, all of our restaurants are still spread, spread out in 16 states. And so, you know, we're kind of uh, the slowdown and, and, and not building it. We built one restaurant in 2010, but we haven't done any since then. So we'll start expansion next year. Any other questions? Any questions? Oh, in the back of there. Hi, um, some of us work for chains that have um, franchisees we need to convince in order to um, kind of do some of the remodeling that's required or, or take into account some of these green initiatives. Do you feel that um, the ROI uh, in many of these initiatives, especially when you talk about solar and, and some of the compost and, and, you know, could you talk about some of the complexities within, you know, using sure. those and, and some of the labor impact that might have with your staff? Absolutely. Well, first of all, let's challenge it this way. Um, Young people that work in our industry care about this. Our communities care about it, and we ought to care about it. So the first ROI that I'm going to challenge conventional thinking is that it's the right thing to do, and we ought to get some, some real good out of that. So that's the motto, eat great, do good. Okay, that's number one. Number two, I think if enough of the big companies that are the big franchises took the bite out of the apple, that we would start to see more production, more innovation, and lower prices. But I think we have to, somebody has to jump first. So I think you have to take, step up and take that bite out of the apple. I've seen, you know, to go where, come down in price as demand goes up. I've seen all that work, straws, everything else. So I think we can do that. Last but not least, I think that, that you know, things like solar, you know, no. I mean, Ted Turner can afford to, spend a, bill, a million dollars and put 25 solar panels up. But by the way, we're in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. Not only is our nine-story building off the grid, we have excess power. We can't put it back on the grid, which is unfortunate because of the way things work. But we could give back power to those that need it. But we also have planted wildflowers and painted our parking lot gray. And, our, and our, the, the heat coming off of our parking lot went down by eight degrees. Why in the world do we use black asphalt, y'all? Somebody tell me that. What, you know, hello, you know? So these are the kind of things. So here's what we had. All summer long, we've got bees and butterflies in downtown Atlanta on our wildflowers in our gray parking lot underneath our solar panels. It's an island. It's an oasis for tourists and people to come by that are going to CNN and other places. So here's what we're doing. We're an example. I'm not suggesting that everybody can do that, but somebody has to do it. So solar's the toughest of the bunch. We talked about it earlier, light bulbs, low flow equipment, those all have an ROI on them. They're really easy to sell. Some of the other stuff that's on the fringe, I just think, who's going to jump first? The industry's not going to develop itself or lower prices or, or, or make more innovative products until we demand them. And in order to demand them, we're going to have to be the people to step up and say, you know what, I'm going to pay you know, a, a quarter of a cent more for that product or a penny more or two cents more or five cents more. And you know what I say? I think you can put it into your pricing. 
I, I, I really do. I think that, that our industry, this is a whole nother subject, has put itself in a tough spot with all the discounting we've become addicted to. And we've created customer bases that think that, you know, we're a commodity when in reality, you know, we're, we're, our margins are razor thin. We're providing jobs. We're paying taxes. We're giving a service to the community. We give back more to the community than any other industry that I know of. I don't know about you all, any of you that in the restaurant business, how many free meals you get asked for a year. You know, so the facts are that we really are good citizens in our communities. We're also a place where people come to entertain themselves, come to let their problems go away. You know, we're probably the most exciting experience they've had in, in that day or that week if we're doing it right. So I think that, that we can ask until we can get the pricing down. I think we can put the nickel more per guest that it costs into our pricing structure and, and not have a problem. It's going to make you hike all the way over there. I want to get the, <laughs> the reason why I'm doing is I want, no, to the, got it. I want to get the question on tape. George, uh, I, I can tell by many of the things that you've, you've listed that there are techniques that are applicable across the country. Are there techniques that you're seeing now that have a regional bias that one thing works in one part of the country but it works better in another part of the country? Are there, are there regional uh, strategies that you, you're exercising now? Yeah, I think probably that's true. I mean, I think that obviously um, things like solar work better in certain places, but, but I also think, di you and I had this conversation at breakfast. Distribution, to me, is the real ballyhoo of, of what we've got going on. I was talking about this. This is, this is, I just had a meeting the other day. Um, the Chinese and, 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 and the Asian community has developed what are essentially just think of floating docks. These docks can, instead of a harbor, like San Diego Harbor or Savannah Harbor or New York Harbor or Baltimore Harbor, they can be up to 100 miles offshore. These giant container ships that have 12,000 containers on them, there's only one harbor in the U.S. that they can get in, and that's San Diego, because they have too big, deep of a draft. They're too big for the harbors we have. So what we're going through in Georgia right now is they want to dredge the harbor, and they want to drag eight feet of the harbor bottom out, you know, eight feet deeper, so these giant ships can get in. Well, this is a floating harbor that has robotic small boats that literally have no human being, they're all controlled, you know, they're droids. And they could, you could park this thing on the East Coast and it could take containers to Jacksonville, to Savannah, to Charleston, to Baltimore, all basically, and maybe not far, from pretty much the same harbor that's out away. Ships come in, get unloaded, they don't have to go through all the technique of getting in and out of these small harbors through a shallow draft, running ashore, digging up the bottom, destroying the, 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 uh, the ocean uh, on their way in. That technology is available today. We have to have the foresight to use it. And, and, and so to answer your question, just to show you what distribution really is. Today, these giant container ships that are coming from Europe to deliver products to the east coast of the United States bypass the coastline, go through the Panama Canal, come up to San Diego, unload uh, from their 12,000 container container ship, put the products on trains, and the trains come to Texas, and from Texas is distributed by 18-wheelers. And that same product that was near Savannah some weeks before is now coming right back to Savannah or Atlanta or Washington, D.C. This is a problem, folks. We have a million restaurants distributed out across 50 states in just the United States, let alone the world. And distribution is the number one cost factor. Look at it. We buy potatoes from Idaho, especially grown for Ted's Montana Grill for our fresh cut French fries. We pay $6 a box, FOB, Idaho. There's $9 to $14 in freight charges to get them to our restaurants. So our, we go from $14 to $20 a box. So we've got to do something about distribution, and I do think that then the same thing applies. 
you know, in the southeast, you've got a, a certain set of issues like we use coal for power, and we've got to think differently about that. Out west, we've got the opportunity for sunlight and wind power that I think can sustain us. You know, we've got all sorts of options, and we need to use all of them. We, we absolutely categorically need to use all of them, and the same thing I would think, and I'm not an expert on that, but I'm going to think about it because the end of the day is there probably are things that work better in the cold northeast and work in the warm southwest or something like that, but, but, it, but it's very true. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but George, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you all for having me. <laughs> Appreciate it.